Welcome to Christ the King Church, Shelby, North Carolina. Hi, welcome to Christ the King Church. I'm Melinda, Pastor Moore's starter. I want to welcome you to the service today, but I want to take a moment and tell you about some of our services here at Christ the King through the week. From On Sunday morning, from 10 to 10.30, we have Sunday school. At 10.45, we have communion, which is open to all baptized believers. At 11 o'clock, we start our worship service. At the end of our worship service, we have a time of ministry where our elders will anoint you with oil and pray over you for healing or whatever your need may be. On Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, we have our regular midweek service. On Thursday, this is our little special meeting that I want to take a moment and explain to you about. It's called our healing room evening. It's from 6.30 to 8, and it's a time of teaching and ministry time. The teaching is from 6.30 to 7.30 because we believe that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. At 7.30 to 8, it's the ministry portion of it in which we have a group of people that will pray over you for whatever your need may be, be it physically, financially, emotionally, mentally, whatever you desire prayer for, they will come in agreement with you about. Also, if you do not have a specific need that you want prayer over, feel free to come and join us anyway from 6.30 to 7.30 during the teaching time. At this time, again, I would like to welcome you, and we will join the ministry now. I want to welcome you to Christ the King Church. I'm one of the associate pastors here, Sam Parsons, and this is our School of the Bible. We're going to be studying today about how God gives us preferential treatment. Before we get into the Word, let's pray and then we'll get into the Word this afternoon. Father, we just thank you so much for your Word. Lord, we thank you that you've get, you do give us preferential treatment. And we'll go through the Scriptures today, Lord, and to show how much you love us, how much you care for us, and how you want us to have good things. You provided those things, Father, not based on anything that we've done, all based on the goodness of Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished. Lord, I pray you'd help me to convey only those things that you want me to convey, only those things that you've given me, Father. Lord, just be with us. May this time be blessed. May your people hear the word you want them to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about God gives us undeserved preferential treatment. Now, that's very much a one of the descriptions of what grace is. We talk about grace and how God loves us and how God wants to minister to us and that grace was provided for us through what Jesus Christ did. Grace can be described as the undeserved, unmerited favor of God, but one of the other definitions of grace is that it's preferential treatment. God loves us so much that He's provided preferential treatment for us in our lives. I want to show you a couple of the scriptures that point to that and then we'll dig into it a little bit deeper. Romans 1 verse 7 says this. Now Paul is speaking directly to the, to the Roman church. And he says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things I found very interesting is that in studying this, if you look at nearly all the letters that Paul wrote, he will start every letter with this particular greeting where he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He did that in nearly every one of those letters, as I mentioned, at the beginning. And then what's interesting is that for many of them, he would also do that at the end of the letter. He'd repeat that same blessing and prayer for the people there that truly grace would be upon us and upon those people and peace that only comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was trying to make sure that he informed the people 
and help to remind them of the grace and peace that is available to us. And as I mentioned earlier, that grace means the undeserved, unmerited favor of God, which can also mean preferential treatment. When we begin to look and study the Scriptures, what we see is God wants to remind us that this preferential treatment, because it is undeserved and unmerited, was all made possible by what Jesus Christ did for us. There's very little in our Christian walk that wasn't provided for us directly from what Jesus has done for us. And that's what's so encouraging to me is that the Christian life is not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon what Jesus did. Now what I have to do is I have to utilize the things that Jesus provided for us. Each one of us have to do that. We have to utilize what He's given us. You might could even say this, like Jesus deposited all these things of grace and safekeeping for us. But unless we go there and we make use of the grace gifts that He gave us, then we're not going to be as successful in our Christian lives as He really wants us to be. Let's go now to Ephesians 2 and we'll look at verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. They say this. Look at this. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, our salvation comes through faith and it's nothing that we could earn. I think one of the things that concerns me is I still hear a lot of people trying to mix grace and works. That doesn't work. It's either grace or it's by works. If it's by grace, then we're not doing things to try to earn our salvation. What we're doing is we may do works to show our appreciation, and to exercise our faith. But we are in no way earning our salvation. Because he says right here, our salvation is not of works. It's a gift of God. That way no man can boast about how they earn their way to heaven. I recommend that you meditate the book of Romans because there's so much mentioned here about the grace of God how He loves us and cares for us. Romans 3 and verse 24 says this, <clears throat> Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Let's go back up and let's start with 23. I want to come back through 24. <clears throat> verse 23 of chapter 3 of Romans says this, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So you see, our redemption is through Christ Jesus. Not of our works, not things that we've, deserved, we've done. We don't deserve it. and It's nothing that we did to deserve or earn any of it. It's always through Jesus so our redemption was through what Jesus did. While we're in Romans, let's go to Romans 5 and verse 18. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. We're talking there about the sin of Adam. Even so, by the righteousness of one, which was Jesus, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. It 
See, it's important for us to realize that these things are gifts. Our salvation is a gift. The grace of God that He gives us is a gift. It's nothing that we've earned. And you see, what we need to understand is everything we have, our redemption, our salvation, many of the blessings that we have are gifts of God and not something that we can earn. And as I said, that's where we have to be careful. We're not doing works to earn salvation. We're doing works to show our appreciation for what God's done for us. And also, we do works to help exercise our faith. The Word says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we have to have faith, and the only way your faith works is by you exercising it. It's just like muscles. If you don't exercise your muscles, they tend to atrophy and get smaller, lose strength. But if you work them and exercise them, then they grow, get stronger. And so that's the same way with our faith. Now while we're in Romans, let's go now to Romans chapter 11. As I said, there's so much in Romans that we could dig out. But in Romans chapter 11, let's look at verse 6. It says this, It says, and if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. The Bible continuously tells us that we cannot, did not, and never will earn our salvation through our works. All these things come through Jesus Christ. They're a gift of Him. They're a gift of God for us. And He does this because He loves us and He wants to show us His favor, His grace, which all these things are unmerited, undeserved, and not one of them can we earn or attain any other way than through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's go now to uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, we'll look at verses... We'll go to chapter 8, excuse me, and we'll look at verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He says this, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So we've already seen our salvation, our redemption, all were, were free gifts of God through what Jesus did. And here we, we're told that Jesus became poor so that we might become rich. I believe God wants his people blessed. That means having financial security, uh, having enough to meet all of our needs, and some to share with others. And I don't think there's anything wrong with Christians being rich. The thing about it is that is this. We should not be looking to get these riches, to spend them all on ourselves, to be selfish with them. God wants us to have these things so that we can help out our brothers and sisters. I'm very frustrated when I see so many TV evangelists and the like who live in multi-million dollar homes. What is the status of their churches? Are there people in their churches that could be helped and benefited from some of that money that they used on themselves? I'm not opposed to people having a nice home, nice automobiles, but there's a point where it gets extravagant and we are supposed to be a light to the world and show them that we, want to, that we are a blessing and want to bless other people. God blesses us so that we can bless others. So that really troubles me when I see that. If the church was doing what we were really supposed to do, the government should have never been involved and helping take care of the poor. Jesus told the church it's fault to take care of the poor. But we don't do a very good job of it. And we know what the government does when they get involved in things. They seem to make it much, much worse. So, 
I think it's important for us to realize what we've been called to do as the church. Jesus wants to make us rich. He said He came to make us rich. He said He became poor so that we might become rich, but it's not for us to be living extravagant lifestyles and not helping others who are in need. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Hebrews 4, 16. Give me just a minute to get there. Hebrews 4 and 16. He says this, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's comforting to me to know that when I have issues or problems, I can go to the throne of grace and get mercy to help me in the time of need. Unfortunately, too many Christians only want to come to God when they have need. Now that's great. And He wants us to come to Him when we have need. But really, we should not be waiting until we're in really bad need before we come before Him and just give Him praise and worship and glorify His name because He's worthy for all those things. We shouldn't just wait until something bad happens and then that's the only time we really want to spend time in prayer with God. It, we have to develop a relationship with Jesus, and that takes spending time with Him, spending time in the Word, meditating upon the Word. And he says we can come boldly before the throne of grace because of what Jesus did for us. Did you notice there? It's called the throne of grace where we received that undeserved, unmerited favor of God. And then it says so that we can obtain mercy and find unmerited, undeserved favor of God when we are in need. So you see, He wants to help us. He wants to bring us through those things. And I'm grateful for that, but I think we need to be going to Him a little more often, not just when we have needs, but on a regular basis. Let's turn now over to James. James 4. Let's look at verse 6. James 4, 6 says this, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. When we try to say that we have earned our salvation through our works, I believe we're showing a lot of pride when we recognize that our salvation, our redemption, is a gift of God through faith in Jesus Christ, then we're showing Him that we, are, we understand who we are. We have humility and recognize that we should not be pumped up and prideful because there's not a thing that we've ever done to deserve what God has given us. And when we come to Him in humility, recognizing our need of Him, then He gives us even more grace. He will give us grace. And it says more grace. I don't know that you can ever have too much of the favor of God. So that means we can never have too much grace. God wants to supply our needs. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be prosperous. He wants us to be healthy in our bodies. All that is available through the grace of God. And it says if we're humble and recognize our need of Him, then He gives even more grace. Now 2 Peter is an interesting scripture because 2 Peter talks about the fact that 
grace can even be multiplied to us. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, and it says this, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. If you read that verse, what you see is that grace and peace can be multiplied to us, but how does that happen? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. I told our church family here a few about a week ago that if you wanted to have a successful 2017 and live a more successful and more happy life in 2017, there were things we needed to do. One of them is to renew our minds. How do you do that? Well, what he's telling us here is that we need to grow in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And how do you do that? Getting into the Word of God. We need to be studying the Word. We need to be meditating the Word. We need to keep the Word in front of us. Back when, if you go back into Joshua, in the first chapter, God keeps telling Joshua, keep the Word of, your God, of the God on your lips, in your mind, in your heart. Never let it get away from you. And you see, that's where our study of the Word is so important. So that we increase in our knowledge of God and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As we do that, the grace of God, the mercy of God, can increase and actually multiply in our lives. As I said earlier, I don't think you can ever have too much of the grace or favor of God. I want it to be multiplied to me. I want it to be multiplied to you. I want it to be multiplied to all the believers. And see, the way that we do that, I love the fact that he tells us here it can be multiplied. And then he tells us how it can be multiplied. And he says, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So it's important that we see that our priorities need to be straight for this next year. Really at all times, but especially this coming year. Our priorities are stay in the Word, meditate the Word. The Word tells us, study to show yourselves approved. A workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. Now we look at that and oftentimes we say, oh, that's just for the preacher. No. You don't seem to realize it sometimes, but you are a minister of Jesus Christ whether you're ordained or not. You probably heard me say this before if you've seen any of, the, any of these videos. But the one thing I've told our people many times is you are the only Jesus that some people will ever see. You see, if you bear the name Christian, they're going to look at you and the way you live, the way you treat them, the way you treat other people, and they're going to draw their conclusion of Jesus based on what they see in your life. So you see, it's important for us to understand how, how much of a responsibility we have and how important it is for us to live a life, to treat people in the way that we would want to be treated so that we can show them what a wonderful Savior we actually serve. Finally here in 2 Peter, let's go to chapter 3, and I want to look at verse 18. This is, a, this is very similar to what we just read. This is the last verse in 2 Peter. And see what he says. It says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be both glory, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. See, he says we can grow in grace, but we also need to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The only place that we can really do that is by studying the Word of God. The other thing I would encourage you is you need to be in a Bible believing church where they teach and preach out of the Word. 
If you're going to a church and you never see a minister open a Bible or give you any scriptures out of the Bible, I'm just going to tell you that's a dangerous place and you probably need to get out of there. Find some place that teaches and preaches the Word of God. We're going to be judged by this Word. We're going to be judged by how we took care of this Word. In other words, how we apply it to our lives. We need to walk in faith. Our faith needs to increase. That also increases through study of the Word and really knowing who Jesus Christ is. That's all possible through the Word of God. And the other thing, as I mentioned, is spending time in prayer. You develop relationships by talking to other people. You develop your relationship with Jesus by spending time and talking to Him. And I guarantee you, if you get in the habit of doing that, what you're going to find is you won't be doing all the talking. Now, I'm not going to tell you necessarily that you're going to hear an audible voice, but Jesus will speak to you. He speaks both through the Word and He'll only give upon you impressions or thoughts that come into your mind that you know you had never thought about. There'll be things revealed to you, and that's where developing this relationship with Jesus is so important so that we have conversations with Him and He can shed light on some things. Everything we need to know is in this Word. But there are going to be situations that don't line up exactly and He will give you direction and information. You know, it doesn't tell us every decision we need to make in the Word. But if we develop a relationship with Jesus, He'll be faithful to give us answers to the questions that we have. He'll guide us and direct us. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. That Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus said when He comes, He won't speak of Himself. He'll speak of me. So you see, with the Spirit of God in us, we can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to develop it. Then we'll be able to live successful lives. Thank you and may the Lord be with you. Thank you for joining us. My prayer for you this week is that you have made Jesus Lord of your life. If not, I pray that you would have a personal visitation from him this week in which you do accept him as Lord of your life. Thank you, and we will see you next week. Thank you for watching Christ the King Church. Follow us on Facebook, and you can also see our sermons published on YouTube.